Hi, Richard. Hey, John. Anything, anything happened last week? Anything exciting? Anything new? Uh, it was a boring week in the comic book industry, wasn't it? I know, kind of a bummer, but hey, at least we've got plenty to talk about here on the show. Uh, we always make it exciting. And if you don't believe me, you should follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bronze and Modern Gods. And if you're watching us on YouTube, please help us out. Hit like, hit subscribe if you haven't already. It really helps us out and gets the word out. And if you listen to us on your favorite podcast platform, why not leave us a review? I saw that new review that we got last week. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate that. Our topic today, viewer mail. We're back to answer all of your viewer mail. We've got the 25-year rule, underrated books of the week. Our hot book of the week, though. No, it's not that one. <laughs> it is Love Everlasting, number one, Richard. I picked this and you said what? I said, this is all you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Finally, finally, a modern book right up my alley. This is a take on all the romance comics of the Golden Silver Age with the twist. Uh, the main character, Joan Peterson, is trapped in sort of a quantum leap kind of situation where she's thrust into romance after romance, and she has to find a way out of this loop. It is a lot more exciting than it sounds, trust me. I really, really enjoyed this book. And look at these covers. The covers are amazing. The Jenny uh, Frizon cover is great. It's like an old Charlton romance comic. It's selling for about four bucks. But my money is on the B cover and the 1 in 100 Clayman sketch variant of that cover. They're selling for about 50 bucks. Check this out. Love that Simon and Kirby young romance cover homage. They, they're, they're tickling all my spots, Richard. Yeah, these, the cover homage has gotten really good recently. I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, these are deep cuts, you know? Uh, I'm sure anyone that doesn't delve into this area of collecting has no idea what these covers are referencing, but I love them. Uh, but more importantly, the story. Here we have yet another image comic uh, that if you're looking for the next 8 billion genies, uh, a.k.a. a concept that's going to make an excellent TV series and last a while, here you go. Uh, they're serving it to you on the platter. Tom King, uh, the writer, and uh, it's selling quite well. Uh, it's moving briskly. Love Everlasting, number one, our hot book of the week. Bet you thought we were going to pick something else, didn't you? No. On that topic, let's move on to viewer mail. You've got you guys mail. didn't have a lot to write about this week. There wasn't really uh, one <laughs> major subject you were writing about. But Richard, why don't you start us off? Well, I will say, you know, we talked about variant covers and uh, the the fact that variant covers were poor investments, uh, typically. So um, <clears throat> this first comment is from uh, Spiders Comics. Um, and this is in re regards to a specific book, uh, <laughs> Dumpster Fire of Fail. Perfect. <laughs> I was kind of, I was kind of proud of that one myself. I have to admit. <laughs> uh, absolutely perfect description of this book. We're talking, of course, about Ultimate Fallout, uh, the facsimile edition, specifically uh, uh, the "In God We In Trust" <laughs> version from Black Flag. Um, so, uh, absolutely perfect description of this book. Morally, every single person in this chain is to blame. And if this kind of post-production manipulation takes off and becomes a regular thing, it has the ability to damage our entire hobby. I completely agree. I believe the uh, outrage over its creation, grading, selling, flipping is valid. This stuff makes me relive the atmosphere of the 90s before it all went belly up. Good points, in my opinion. Uh, th the fact that CGC was willing to grade a book that was modified after production by a publisher by um, you know a, basically a store um, is a dangerous precedent who's to stop other store exclusives from coming out and then modifying whatever backstock they have um, you know the CGC sets a precedent are they going to deny those books um, it's it's a dangerous dangerous road to go down when you start accepting unwarranted or, or um, uh, uh, you know, these modifications to a book post. Unauthorized. Unauthorized. That's the word I was trying to think 
I mean, Marvel <laughs> didn't approve this. And it gets worse, Richard. Not only is CGC grading this and giving it a blue label, they're giving it a 9.9 .9 and a 10 grade, which there is a lot of smoke in this fire that those grades were purchased because they use the Stray Dogs Acetate Edition as a, a precedent. We've done this before, but the Stray Dogs Acetate. Well, none of them were graded 9.9 .9 or 10. How did that happen? Uh -huh. um, so it gets worse the more you dig. It's gross. It is. And, and, and I don't think anybody came out of this, um, as, as uh, Spider Comics says, the whole chain, every single person in this chain has some, um, something to, to uh, some part of the blame for, for the book. And I think it's, it's a, a bad, it's a black eye for the entire industry to have accepted this book to, to the level you would accept any other book published by, by Marvel. I, I think that's a travesty. Agreed. Uh, travesty is a good word. Um, let's kind of try to look at the positives here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm done. Um, no, no. I, I, there are some positives here. People are seeing this stuff for what it is now. Mm -hmm. And now a lot of people, especially people who went through the 90s, uh, are waking up and going, wait a second. I'm not going through this again. I'm going to concentrate on silver, bronze, gold even, and really put my money where it counts. I've seen so many YouTubers and people on Instagram, all you guys, don't worry. I, I see your feeds too. Um, follow you back. And I, it made me feel good. I know it's a weird thing to say, but there is a positive coming out of this. There really is. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. So, Good, good on you guys, the smart ones that are going, wait a second, this is <laughs> this is gross. Uh, my first piece of your mail is from Prodigy23. Richard, did you have Prodigy in the 90s? Me? Yeah, I started on Prodigy when I got on the internet. Did you? Oh, when you say Prodigy, I'm thinking of the band. The band. Yeah, of course, I had that too. Fan of the Land's a great <laughs> album. Um, uh, did I did have Prodigy. I had Prodigy and I had CompuServe and... Uh, yeah, all that fun stuff. Oh, my God. I used to love Prodigy. All right. Uh, Prodigy 23. My my uh, apologies. Um, let's get to your piece of your mail. <laughs> I have the book, the book that we are talking about. I think the book looks great. And I'm sure most people agree. They just want to say what's popular now and act like they don't like it. I have Ultimate Fallout 4 first and second print. If you like the book, buy it. If you don't, then buy something else. Did CGC screw up? Sure. But don't bash people for getting a book they like. It's not their fault. People buy books made out of wood, metal, and other gimmicky things, indeed. Hell, people are buying Winnie the Pooh and Tigger as superheroes. Ooh, shots fired at Merritt Michaels. Uh, and ex-murderers, for Christ's sake. But you're going to draw the line to acetate? Give me a break. Prodigy 23, you're right. Um, some people bought this book because they liked the way it looked. I'm looking at a guy right now that bought this book because of the way it looked. Hi, Richard. Yeah. What do you have, what do you have there? Yeah, I have uh, my copy of uh, of the facsimile. Here we go. Yeah. Um, now that you have it in hand, what do you think of it? I think it's um, eh. I it's a good. It's a. It, I don't think it necessarily is a bad cover. Um, the acetate adds, you know, the stripes here and the flag in his hand. Um, I, I do feel it's a bit contrived. And, and the fact that they're, they're highlighting um, veterans, but yet the veterans don't benefit at all from this book, I think is, 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 uh, is a false flag. But overall, you know, it's, it's the reason I bought it was I am a huge Marvel, uh, uh, Miles fan. Uh, Miles Morales um, is the hero I wish I had when I was uh, a teenager. Um, I, I put in a post this this past week that when during uh, Spider Verse movie I cried because I was so happy to see a character that I could identify with, and more importantly, my son could identify with. Mm -hmm. And um, because this was, you know, really before before this character. Um, there wasn't anybody that I could I could say that my son would be really really inspired by. So you know when this book came out, oops, <laughs> when this book came near, out, near, near mint, yeah, uh, it was it was a limited edition, you know, seven hundred and fifty copies. Um, 
I did not pay the ridiculous prices that are out there now for it. I, I did pay. I did pay more than I think it was uh, around two hundred dollars. I paid. But you didn't know the provenance behind it and the history right. behind it. You bought it the day you heard about it. Oh yeah, yeah. Like like a lot of people, like Prod Prodigy Twenty Three, I'm sure, uh -huh. because you liked it. I did, now, I did, and it's and I still like it. It'll go in my collection. I doubt I'll ever get it slabbed, but it will be. I have first print, second print, both second prints. I have the one in twenty five variant. I have the newsstand variant um, of all the books in Ultimate Fallout. Uh, from one to six, I have all the, the newsstands and variants. Uh, so I'm a huge fan of the series. This is to me is another book. Is, you know, I, I have OCD, so I, I, for completeness' sake, I needed to have a copy of it. And it will be, it'll go in with the rest of my books. And I don't, you know, a lot of people I know are angry about this book, and a lot of people have a lot of vitriol uh, towards the the publisher. But, you know, don't let that translate to the fans. You know, there are a lot of people like me who bought the book because they like Miles or they like the, the book itself. And, you know, this I didn't buy this book to flip. I didn't buy it with any any intent on sharing it with anyone else. This is going to my PC. And, I, you know, my attitude is my collection is my collection. And um, and because I, I got a little heat because when I posted a picture of this, uh, some people were upset about it. And it's like. My attitude is, as long as I'm paying for my collection, I can make the decisions about what's in it. As soon as somebody else starts paying, then you can, you can, you can share in those decisions. <laughs> but until then, uh, it's my choice. I like the book um, well enough to keep it in my collection, and that's where it's going to stay. I think fans like yourself, Miles fans, and people that bought this book that truly wanted it for themselves, you're collateral damage. Yeah. You're, you're, you're getting shrapnel that you did not – anticipate or want you weren't at the front of the line buying 75 copies you were at home buying it from someone on whatnot you know now there's a whole road we can go down there that i'm not interested in going down frankly because who doesn't affect my life however to get on your case because you bought that book you know i razz you a little bit because it's just friggin' ugly um that's the main reason i'm razzing you uh does not uh, clayton crane I don't know if he's getting muddier and muddier with his art. I, I, what's going on with the filters there, buddy? But you didn't know it was a guy in his basement stapling acetate covers to it or however the hell he did it. Who knows? You didn't yeah. know CGC was going to come out with this controversial stance and do all this. So I get it. Um, you know, so uh, good on you, Prodigy 23. Mm -hmm. Good on you, Richard, for... Yeah. And don't yeah. let anybody tell you what you can and cannot collect. Um, <laughs> it's your collection. And I know everyone respect other people. You know, I, 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 I think certain books are, I would never be a part of my collection. John, you mentioned the whole poo thing. I never got that. I don't get it either, but I don't sit there. You know, I don't sit there and go on Instagram and go, why did you buy this trash? Exactly. No, I, if, if that's what you want, if you collect that, then that's more power to you. Now, I will call CGC's response garbage and trash, which I have several times this week on our Facebook and Instagram at Bronze and Modern Gods. If you're not following this, follow us there. Uh, Richard, what is your next piece of viewer mail? My next, next piece of viewer mail is from Hector. Uh, when I got back into comics, I fell for the variant trap and bought every store variant due uh, to FOMO or chased good art. Then, of course, I realized there is always good art and limited doesn't mean anything if there is no demand succinct and correct yes that is that is a very that is a very um as john says very concise comment i agree with it completely i i did the same thing when i when i got back into comics um the what was it was it amazing spider-man oh no it was action comics 1000 was coming out yeah. And I just went to town and on, there must've been 80 variants of, of action comics, 1000. And I bought, I didn't buy 80, but I bought a lot. Mm. Um, some of them I bought, you know, when I was beginning to think about speculation. I bought um, some with that in mind and um, yeah, none of them, none of them panned out in terms of being something that, um, that increased in value over time. So Definitely uh, resist the store variants, resist that whole trap. My recommendation is if you're buying, invest in um, 
copper age and older. Um, so let me let me put a tag. Let me put up a button on that if I can. Yeah. Resist the store variants and stuff unless you like it. Yeah, um, that's true. Love Everlasting number one. I just talked about those variants. How much I love that Charlton comics variant and that Simon and Kirby young romance riff. I bought them. You know why? Because I liked them and they're not going anywhere. I don't I have no delusions of flipping them and, and making a profit. I genuinely like the covers and the price was right. And so I got them. So uh, we say it all the time here. Everybody says it. It's a cliche. Cliches sometimes are true. That's why they're cliches. <laughs> Buy what you like. Yeah, it's true. And I guess as we talked uh, earlier, you know, shape the collection that you want to have, not what you think other people um, are desiring because you may be a big action comic 1000 fan and you may want to buy every one of the, the 80 different variants or detective 1000, which also came out and, or now up, upcoming is uh, amazing Spider-Man 900. You know, it's these... wait, 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 amazing Spider-Man 900. Let's take a second and let that soak. In. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was your first issue of amazing Spider-Man that you bought? Do you know? Oh boy, it had to have been around, it was before Venom, so 230, 240. Oh, before Venom would have to be before, uh, yeah, two, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You, were, you were around right, the Ron Friends DeFalco era, right? 85? Yeah, you know? right, it was, it was before 252, I know, because I remember buying it on the newsstand, but yeah, it was, it was around, yeah, 240-ish. But we're the same age. You didn't get into Spidey until that late. I mean, my first issue was like 145. Like, Oh, I didn't know. I, I wish I had gotten into that. Yeah. Better. I and was I, more of a DC indie uh, guy. That's true. Yeah. X-Men, X-Men too. That's true. I hear 900, Spider-Man 900. And I'm like, <laughs> time to go to pasture, Grampies. Well, uh, but, you know, they keep resetting. They have all these legacy numbering schemes. And so it's hard to keep track of what issue it actually is. And it also went to three times a month. I mean, that really ramped it up uh so when you're being published three times a month right. <laughs> you're gonna hit, you're gonna hit 900 pretty quick uh my next piece of viewer mail is from deep blue hue on instagram hey john and richard loved your last two podcasts just those two i'm feeling very insecure now <laughs> what about the rest of them oh yeah the other ones are dross i know <laughs> i noticed that you guys have been talking about service number one and I was wondering what you thought about that specific book as an investment. Will it come down in price eventually? Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, let me go first, because I'm probably going to have a different opinion than Richard. Or maybe, I don't know, we'll see. I do think it's going to come down in price eventually. When? 10, 15, 20 years maybe? No one's going to know what Cerebus is. No one's going to know who Dave Sim was. Um, he isn't doing anything to build his legacy there isn't a lot of uh, marketing or uh, getting the word out about the classic Cerebus run. Go buy High Society. It's a classic. Go read it. You know, you just have guys our age talking about it on podcasts, and that can only do so much. It's not like Watchmen where there's a film adaptation and a TV series, and it's continually in print and in bookstores. I think Cerebus won. If you want it, great. Uh, I'm sure you will love having it. Do I think it's going to be a $5,000, $10,000 book 15 years from now? I would love to be wrong, but I'm going to say no. Richard? Uh, I so want to say, Jane, you're an ignorant slut. I was going to say, please <laughs> say. <laughs> but I have to kind of agree with you. Uh, it's, it is not an Albedo number two. Um, uh, Cerebus One is an important book. It's very important, especially if you're from that era. Um, it introduced me to the indie market for the most part. But as everything that, that John just said is very true, there is no, you know, after 300, it, the series is over. Um, yeah. There is no new Cerebus content being created. Dave Sim um, does different kind of books right now, which I think detract from his legacy, but that's a whole nother story. Um, so, it will always be an important book historically because of its um, it's making mainstream the, the, the indie market. But the number of people who are going to know what it is, is going to dwindle over time. Just like John says, I mean, there are, are us old 
old fogies who remember uh, buying Cerebus on the mm-hmm. newsstand. But, you know, the newer generations of people uh, are just not going to have any attachment to this book. So eventually it's going to go down in price. Uh, it, it will always retain a certain amount of value. But like John says, I just don't see it uh, doubling or, or you know, doing any of the things that other books of the era that are, that are important, um, you know. And, and, and another, another thing, look at the rest of the series. And number one definitely, I think, has, has, has value. Number two, um, the value goes down pretty precipitously. And then after number two, it's they're pretty much five dollar books. I mean, it's there there just really isn't any retained value in the series, which is unfortunate. Um, a lot of the books, well, maybe not five dollars. The first, let's say the first hundred, maybe of a twenty dollar books, let's put it that way. But the rest of the books, I just don't think have any value. And um, unless at some point someone acquires the rights to Cerebus and um, does something with its legacy. That would be um, something that I think would change the momentum. But for the most part, I think we've 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 seen the peak or close to the peak of the value of service. Unless there is some sort of education that happens in the next few years where people are new collectors are told about the significance of this book, why it's important. It was one of the if not the biggest independent title of its time when it came out. It was one of the first books to really uh, stand its own in the direct market against Marvel and DC. I mean, it was probably selling more than Charlton books in the direct market at the time. So unless people know about that, though, in the next few years, it's going to be a tough road to, to, to hoe there. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's all about visibility. I mean, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have a permanent level of visibility. TM, uh, TMNT number one is always going to have value. It will comfortably increase in value over time. Uh, it may have a dips and in, 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 uh, its peaks and valleys, but I see it always being relevant because they are constantly keeping the name of uh, the turtles in the media. And um, it's just as popular with kids today as you know, kids in the past. But Cerebus, Cerebus just, just is that historical book. And I think, um, like you say, without some kind of education, but, but then, then again, you know, you, you need some level of attachment to, to drive value. And- because there's been two things that have educated younger collectors about Cerebus, the Spawn crossover. Uh-huh. And the Turtles crossover, yeah. speaking of Turtles. And did that cause a big run on, you know, those those collectors going, wow, I really like that Cerebus character. I'm going to go start collecting that. <laughs> I don't think so. No, uh, I, I definitely see the younger the younger collectors moving towards, you know, if I had a choice between a Cerebus number one and um, a Turtles number one, oh. when I was a younger collector, it wouldn't, wouldn't be a, yeah. um, a contest. Um, it really becomes... The value is in those few of us who have fond memories of the original series and have the the financial wherewithal to actually uh, buy one. I would buy one if if I had um, if I came across another problem. There's there's a whole bunch. There's a whole market uh, of fakes for this book. Um, hasn't it, stopped you before. It hasn't. No, no, it hasn't. <laughs> Boy, wow, zinger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Um, my next piece of your mail uh, comes to us from our email at bronzeandmoderngods at gmail.com from John Testa, who had a bunch of questions, but I'm going to put up his final question because it kind of sums everything up. I saw your awesome video on the humidity chamber and pressing. Is this something an old person can easily figure out? Is this something I should do on an old comic? i.e. 1936, 1965, etc. I ask, as the pricing from CGC on grading seems to be 3% of the valuation, not less than $150. That said, how do you have a better way of understanding pre-1975 pricing from CGC? I'm a bit lost on it beyond the above, and a lot are pre-1975. Sorry for the novella, but hoping for some help or guidance. I'd like to preserve my babies. Thanks, John. First of all, John, yes, an old person can easily figure it out. My hand is up. Richard's hand should be up. <laughs> we figured it out. Anyone can. We're pretty dumb. Uh, 
I would not be pressing my own books from 1936 and 1965 until I had a lot of experience messing up dollar bin books right. from every era. Find some cheap $5 readers at a con from the 50s or 60s and 70s. Experiment, experiment, experiment. You're going to learn real quick. Uh, it is not as difficult as it looks. It's very detail-oriented, and there are a lot of steps that have to be taken in order. But like anything else with practice, it becomes second nature. I think it's very zen. I would not trust CGC pressing my books. Um, they are just not very good at it it's a volume game for them they don't care they will not put the love and care into it that you will because it's you doing it become one with the press become one with your book feel the zen feel the satisfaction when you do it right and send it off now as far as pricing goes if you've got really expensive comics you're going to pay that three percent um express it usually handles a lot of things but the really expensive stuff is going to be 3%. So if the book is worth $10,000, guess what? You're paying, I, my math, Richard, $300? $300, right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're the programmer, not me. I, that's, I have computers because I can't do math. That's, that's Okay. That's, that's <laughs> now, one but, thing I have to do, though, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, go ahead. If you're pressing, if you're using a humidity chamber, a humidity chamber is there to introduce moisture uh, into the book uh, because over time the paper dries out and the moisture allows the fabric of the papers to release so that when you press them you end up with a flat surface. The problem with humidity chambers and with older books is the potential of introducing uh, rust on the staples of those books. So I would be careful with the older books. I would look at the staples to see if they already have any sign, um, minor sign of rust and if they do I might be very careful about using a, 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 a humidity chamber. What I do, I've done lots of golden age. Um, there has been rust present sometimes. I will do four hours with eight cups of water in and out. Um, that way it's in the press. It doesn't have time to sit there and permeate the staples the way it does the fibers. Um, and also a great side effect of a uh, humidity chamber for older books is you might get a page quality bump. Sometimes yeah. cream pages will become off-white. Sometimes off-white pages will become white. Like John says, experiment. Go to your local uh, LCS, buy a stack of dollar books, and press them one at a time until you feel confident before you start pressing your expensive books. Yeah, and if you're really freaked out about it and you don't want to do it, find a reputable presser. Uh, I'm sure people can recommend some here in the comments. Richard, what is your next piece of your mail? My next piece of viewer mail is from Shadow Spawns. I am no longer on social media. Congratulations. And I'm as happy as a J-board collecting what makes me happy. Uh, this is why I love comics, a.k.a. funny books. I don't need justification or other collectors telling me what I should be buying. Always happy to watch or watching both of you converse in comics. Can't wait for the next one. Well, thank you very much. Yep, this is this is great. This is the attitude you should have. This is your collection. You're you're investing your time and money into um, forming the collection. Do what you want, and don't um, don't let other people's attitudes um, affect how you feel about your collecting and the methods that you collect and what you collect. Uh, is these are this is a very personal, very in, individual type of hobby, and revel in that. All right. You have another piece of viewer mail from Peter Eddy. Yep. Um, one of my favorite store variants is Wonder Woman Black and Gold, the Lou variant. Uh, I love that. Warren Lou, Warren Lou does such an amazing job. It's one of the few variants I have bought that has increased in value. I fell into the whole FOMO thing when I got back into collecting, it, and I have a lot of store variants that I couldn't sell for what they cost. Amen. Uh, I came to the conclusion that I should only buy what I like and not what's hot. Yep, that's it. I absolutely love that. When I saw that that uh, Wonder Woman Black and Gold, the Warren Lou cover, um, it just I was mesmerized. It is by far my favorite cover from um, favorite DC cover of all time, um, and it's it's just striking. So, did you like my imitation? Your what? My imitation of the cover. Oh. <laughs> 
Uh, I prefer I prefer Warren's version of Ah, uh, bummer. <laughs> Uh, it's one of those rare examples of a variant cover. I mean, you know, Legion of Superheroes 23, uh, Adam Hughes cover is another example. There are some some variant covers that end up have appreciating in value because they're special. They have some quality to them that makes them stand out. Um, and I think that that, um, that black and gold cover is one of those, you know, in, in, in that particular uh, category. But for the most part, variant, variant covers are a matter of taste, buy them because you love them, not because you want to make money. That's what Peter says too. Uh, my final piece of viewer mail is from our good buddy, Dean the Barbarian. <laughs> Deaner, he writes, hi again, guys. John, are you still dissatisfied with Richard's purchase of the Ultimate Fallout 4 acetate cover <laughs> after seeing that's in five figures on eBay? Several sellers have went this route, and if I was Richard, I'd flip mine real quick, wait for it to die down in maybe December, and buy it again for the PC around Christmas. See yas, Dean. First of all, check out Dean's channel. It's hysterical. He and his son play video games. It's really funny. Dean, I don't think those auctions are real. I think what has happened is a group of people have run up the prices to really mess with the people selling this book. Uh, I don't think they're actually seeing those sales. I think that there's going to be a lot of cancellations, a lot of relistings, a lot of things going on. If you go on the CGC forums, you see people openly talking about running up the bids with no intention to pay. So don't be fooled. Am I still dissatisfied with Richard's purchase of the Ultimate Fallout 4 acetate cover? No, I don't think dissatisfied is. Uh, I don't think I'm disappointed in Richard anyway. I, we all know why Richard bought that book, you guys. This is not a shock. Right. <laughs> Richard is the biggest Miles Morales fan you're going to meet, and he saw something that looked like a legitimate new variant that was supremely limited. FOMO kicked in, and he bought it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. basically it. That's basically it. Yeah, they are, there is a huge amount of trolling going on on eBay right now. Um where they're raising the value of this book to ten thousand dollars. It's 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 never going to sell for that. They're no. just doing that um, in an effort to stop the sellers from actually selling your book. And it's 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 childish in my opinion. And where do these people have the time? We barely have time to record. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I really would like to know. Give me give me your time management secrets. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it's it, you know, like I said, this book is my is for my PC. I don't plan on flipping it. I really have no interest in selling it. Um, it will just go in my long box, and it will be a part of my Miles collection that I'll pass on to my kids. Thank you for that email, Dean. If there's one thing I know about Dean from the uh, his presence on the live premieres of our shows, it's that he loves a good segue for our favorite time, Dean, yourself, and me. The 25 year rule. <laughs> Typing exclamation points. <laughs> 25 year rule is when we look at books from 25 years ago, in this case, 1997, 25 years when that nostalgia kicks in. And this week we are looking at Nexus number 98, AKA Nexus Nightmare in Blue number four. This was the last issue of the Star Horse miniseries, which they also continued the legacy numbering for Nexus. And the last issue of Nexus until 2007's issue 99 from Steve Rude's Rude Dude Productions. Nexus ran forever, Richard. Remember when it started in the early 80s from Capital Comics that went over to First? I never read it, to be honest with you. With well, my pull list. we're going to talk about that in a second, but first... This was by the classic Nexus creative team of writer Mike Barron and artist Steve Rude. Just based on this creative team alone, Richard, we both love Mike Barron's writing on The Punisher and Flash, and Badger, and the beautiful art of Steve Rude inspired by Alex Toth, Jack Kirby. I've never gotten into Nexus. I've never <laughs> read it either. <laughs> it, I, it's one of those books I see all the time when I go to shows. You know, it's always, it's always there in a long box. I, I've just never read it in person. You can get a complete set of this miniseries on eBay for about eight bucks. But what are we missing? What are Richard and I missing? I, I love Mike Barron's writing. Uh -huh. I love Steve Rude's art. And yet I have tried Nexus when I owned or not owned when I managed the comic shop. Oh, I owned one too. Um, 
and I could read it for free. I tried several times. I didn't understand one thing that was going on. It was not very new reader friendly, which was probably by design. It was a long involved space opera yeah. i'm also not a big fan of space opera you know unlike richard who loves his star wars i have not seen a star wars movie since the empire strikes back don't tell people that i'm telling people that because i want them to know where i'm coming from i am oh, i'm a man. comedy uh guy um crotchety that's what they, that's what i they am mean. get off my lawn and get that <laughs> spaceship out of my yard uh i i i really should yeah i'm like you we should like this book why don't we like it yeah, that's a good question. Maybe maybe I'll try to to read it again. It's like you said, it's it's something that never stuck with me. I, I remember reading a copy or two, but it just never stuck with me in terms of continuing. I remember in the Badger, uh, in the early run of the Badger, there were backup strips, and one of the backup strips was one of the supporting characters from Nexus in his own little series. And I would try to read those eight pagers, and I'd be like, "Why are they wasting space on this?" When it, <laughs> yeah, give me more Badger, or give me a a story about Ham or something in the back. I don't want to read about this guy. So, I, you know, sometimes I'd get violent about it. There was a crossover with the Badger and Nexus around issue 50. And I was like, don't get your Nexus in my Badger. <laughs> uh, so tell us what we're missing, because I'm sure we are yeah, missing. Time for our underrated books of the week. Richard, what is yours? I picked a DC book, uh, specifically Action Comics number 775 from 2001. Uh, this is the first appearance of one of my favorite DC character names, Manchester Black. That is just an awesome name. I love it. Uh, he led a team called uh, the Elite, uh, he was, which was a vigilante team that killed the villains that they caught. Unlike Superman. You know what the Elite was a, a play on? No. Remember the Authority? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. This is their play on the Authority. <laughs> How would ever the real Superman handle the Authority? Right. Well, that's the whole thing. Uh, it's It's... It's basically Manchester Black, who is of a very dark anti-hero type of character who later turns villain, full villain. Reminds me a lot of the boys, you know, the, the kind of the way that uh, that storyline has progressed. Um, yeah, he was a member of the Suicide Squad. He, um, he was uh, working for the government. He was working for President Luther, which was awesome. Um, he, his powers uh, are... are, are telekinesis and uh telepathy telekinesis he once gave superman a stroke by pinching the uh, blood vessels in his brain which are you sure that wasn't from eating red meat <laughs> uh he, he was obsessed with um proving that superman wasn't as as wholesome as he uh projected himself to be i'm not going to give away the whole storyline but yeah. um Oh, okay. Well, well, he he apparently killed Lois Lane in an effort to get Superman to uh, basically rage out and and lash out at him. Superman took the high road in the whole thing, and um, Black was so distraught that he had gone down that road to make himself the villain of the story that he actually killed himself in issue seven ninety six. So much uh, for not telling the whole story. <laughs> sorry. Well, I thought you said go ahead. Um, Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Lois did not die, of course. Lois, Lois was Lois is fine. Has um, Manchester Black returned? Do you know? Not that I, not that I know of. I haven't, I haven't seen any uh, continuation from that uh, end of seven ninety six. But the interesting thing, I think this, this is a dark character, which is, which is hard to find in Superman's um, universe. Uh, someone who pushes the boundaries of morality in a way that. Um, forces superman to re reiterate his boundaries because the thing about superman is he is all he is basically omnipotent and he has to hold the line that he uh holds or otherwise uh you know any exceptions to the rule in terms of his morality uh will lead him down a dark path just look at um the injustice uh series if you yeah. want to see what happens to superman when he when he <laughs> it goes full rage on, um, so it's I, I think it's interesting in that it reinforces that in the character, and I love stories where you have these complex uh, plays between um, what's morally correct and what's what uh, people deem to be correct. Um, so 
this book, uh, there's a 9.8, uh, goes for about 163. There's a second print for this book, and the second print, the 9.8 only goes for 57. Um, there are 100 books are graded at 9.8 on the census, so it's, it's, it's not uncommon, but still, you can go out and find one. The second print, there are only 25 total on the census. I like Superman where he's put in a position where he has to um, justify his his morality, a complex situation like this, as opposed to, you know, you've got the bad guy number one who's got a ray gun and he's you know, threatening to destroy blah, blah, blah. And Superman has to, you know, that that black and white morality. I like it. I like mine uh, a little more gray. So you're not here for another Elastic Lad showdown? No, no. I mean, they have their place. I mean, this the same thing goes for the Legion. You know, Legion has a lot of, you know, black and white, you know, heroes are good and villains are bad storylines and they all wrap up at the end of the issue. And that's fine for the 60s. But, you know, we're talking this is 2001 that this book is written. And um, I think our, our the audiences nowadays want something more complex. That book is 21 years old. Yeah, I know. I know. Oh, <laughs> my underrated book of the week is Savage Dragon number 140. Now, I was a huge fan of this Eric Larson creation until around issue 100 when the entire concept was thrown out the window and Dragon was thrown into this commandy type world. You know, Eric Larson, obviously a big Jack Kirby fan, said, I want to draw commandy. So instead of reviving commandy at DC, he just threw the dragon into commandy's <laughs> Uh, so I missed this issue when it came out, be, which besides the usual Eric Larson insanity featured Spawn, Invincible, Witchblade, Shadowhawk, and a big image crossover. I'm bummed I missed this now because it's super expensive and I'm trying to fill my Savage Dragon run. There was a low print run around this time. It's all over the place on eBay from $65 to 100 bucks or so just for this wow. issue. Yeah, uh, CGC 9.8 sold last July for $150. I wonder if there's a 10.0, Richard. Is there a 10? Uh, I'm moving on, moving on. Um, Savage Dragon, I'm still buying it out of habit. I've not read it in a while. I flipped through it, and I wonder when it became straight-up porn. Uh, yeah, there's, like, boobies. Yeah. Uh, stuff. <laughs> Okay, so okay, so that that okay, I never read Savage Dragon up straight up to begin with, but I have noticed uh, a lot of the covers have been more sexually oriented. Um, yeah, when did when, I, I I assumed that that was something that was a long long uh, term thing, but that's something new. I would say the last five years or so, it's gone in that direction. Um, it's a bummer. I love his art so much that I just can't give it up. It's like, you know, watching a slow Dave Sim like train wreck. Um, but what are you going to do? Uh, hopefully it's his book. It's his creation. I mean, he's, he's not doing anything that an adult would be offended by. I just, you know, it's just taking it in a weird direction. Yeah. Well, it definitely changes his, his target audience. Yeah. So for sure. So Savage Dragon 140, yeah. get, it, get it if you see it out there in the bins and send it to me because I don't have it. Please, thank you. No, don't do that. Keep it for yourself. And that is going to wrap it up for this episode. Richard, where can they find us on the social medias if they use it? They can find us at Bronze and Modern Gods or at the website bronzeandmoderngods.com. And if you like these videos, please hit subscribe. Please hit like. It really does help us out. I know every YouTuber says that, but it actually does help the algorithm. All right, and we will catch you next time. Yeah, everybody stay safe.